Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, a new species of pterosaur has been named after an alien from Avatar, elephants have been discovered to use names for each other, the smallest ever hominid has been found, and much more. Starting off the news this week, a study published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society has been analysing the remnants from the last major merger of our Milky Way galaxy. It's a fun fact often passed around that our galaxy will collide with the Andromeda galaxy, our closest galactic neighbour, in around 4 billion years time. While this sounds alarmingly catastrophic, unless we're ridiculously unlucky, there won't be any actual collisions between stars and planets during this collision but both galaxies will be shuffled around a lot as their gravitational influences affect each other. A similar event to this happened about 8 to 11 billion years ago, but astronomers in this study started to realise that the effects from an event like this seem to be far more recent than this merger. They came to the conclusion that the debris from the most recent major merger is much younger, meaning it must have come from a much more recent event referred to as the Virgo Radial Merger which only happened around 3 billion years ago. This is comparatively much, much more recent than the previous one, and actually occurred during the Earth's lifetime. One of the study's authors talked about how the history of our galaxy is constantly being rewritten, thanks to new technology like the Gaia spacecraft, whose data was used in this study. It's a fascinating insight into how astronomers are gradually unpicking our most distant history in more and more detail. And in other news, I just wanted to quickly mention SpaceX's latest Starship launch, which came packaged with a couple of extra milestones that the team hit. This fourth launch has made significant progress compared to the first two, with both the lower booster and the main ship vehicle making soft landings in the ocean, despite the ship taking damage during re-entry. While we do have some footage of the booster landing in the ocean, we don't yet have anything to see from the ship stage, so exactly how smooth that landing was is unclear. It's an important milestone though, as they are looking to get Starship ready for NASA's Artemis mission in 2026, since they've been tasked with building the landing vehicle that will take astronauts from lunar orbit to the lunar surface. The next test flight of Starship will hope to actually land and catch the booster rocket back at the launch site, so it can be reused, just like the main ship. Next up, an incredible new study has found evidence suggesting that African elephants use specific calls to address individuals. Essentially, they have names for each other. An important distinction is made between animals that call each other by names which are imitations of the typical calls of the individual, such as how dolphins and parrots use names for each other, versus how humans use names. With humans, names are not imitations of the sounds that the named individual makes, but rather abstract labels used to identify an individual. Well, researchers have now used machine learning techniques to analyse hundreds of recordings of wild African elephant calls in Kenya, finding that these incredible animals actually address each other with individually specific calls that are not imitations of the receiver, so more like the human concept of names rather than dolphin or parrot names. They also found that the elephants would respond differently to playbacks of calls addressed to them specifically, compared to when the call was addressed to another elephant. This is a pretty incredible discovery, suggesting that these wonderful animals may be capable of abstract thought, and demonstrating that they are using arbitrary communication in which a sound represents an idea, which is considered a next level cognitive skill. It's an absolutely fascinating new study. Also in the news, a group of researchers have published a paper that has investigated the possible causes of the recent increase in deaths and serious injuries of large whales along the east coast of the US. The stranding of large whales has been elevated since 2016, and an unusual mortality event has been recognised since 2017. It has impacted humpback and minke whales in particular. This has been a contentious issue, with some environmental groups arguing that it is due to wind turbines being built offshore. The scientists assessed the spatial and temporal trends in whale strandings, and considered the possible ecological and anthropogenic drivers of these patterns. Only around 20% of dead whales come ashore, but investigation of the bodies provides evidence of the cause of death. Before the unusual mortality event, humpback whales were observed to die due to entanglement significantly more often than those killed due to vessel strikes. However, during the unusual mortality event, the death of humpback whales due to vessel strikes increased threefold. The scientists suggest that the increase in mortality due to vessel strikes is due to a combination of factors such as changes in humpback whale habitat use, the fact that they engage in surface feeding behaviour and 
shallow waters, that many of them were inexperienced juvenile whales, and increases in vessel traffic in these regions. They conclude that their findings highlight the problems faced by increased shipping, particularly when the habitat use by these large whales changes, and that in order to protect these large whales, there is a need for management actions that can respond to these dynamic threats. First up in the paleontology news for this week is the fantastic news that a new species of pterosaur has been named. The new flying reptile has been recognised from an amazing site in southern Brazil, known as the pterosaur graveyard. This locality, dating to the early Cretaceous period sometime between 120 and 100 million years ago, preserves hundreds of bones coming from pterosaurs known as tapajarids, which had striking head crests and toothless jaws. The graveyard was first described back in 2014, but paleontologists thought that all the bones had come from a single tapajarid species, which they called Kaiwajara dobruskii, I think. They previously recognised a lot of variation in all the bones, which they had attributed to the skeletons representing different growth stages of the species, or explained it as just being down to individual variation. However, this new research has analysed the bone bed and found that the skeletons can actually be classified into two distinct morphs, providing evidence that there were in fact two different tapajarid species in this graveyard. As such, they now name the second species Torokjara banderai. The paper explains the naming of the species as coming from the word Toruk, the Na'vi name for the giant, kind of pterosaur-like, Great Leonopteryx in James Cameron's Avatar films, since this tapajarid had a head crest resembling the aliens. Interestingly, this isn't actually the first time that a pterosaur has been named after an alien from Pandora, as in 2020 paleontologists named Ikran Draco Avatar, referencing the film's name as well as the Ikran, the Na'vi name for the smaller flying creatures of Pandora, since this pterosaur had a projecting crest on its lower jaw like the Ikran do. Anyway, Torokjara is known from some pretty good fossil material coming from the pterosaur graveyard, with eight of the specimens from the site being referred to the new species. The species was able to be distinguished from Kyrajara due to differences in the skull and neck bone anatomy that don't appear to relate to the size of the specimen, meaning they're unlikely to be growth stages of the same species. It's also very interesting that we now know there were two coexisting similar species of tapajarids that were preserved in this graveyard together, suggesting that there may have been some interesting interactions between the species. Also in the recent paleo news, a long-standing marine reptile mystery has just been solved. Pachystrophius reticus is a reptile that lived at the end of the Triassic period, about 205 to 201 million years ago, and despite being a relatively well-known fossil in certain deposits in England, figuring out what sort of reptile this animal actually was has been a bit of a puzzle. One of the problems is that we don't know what the skull of Pachystrophius looked like, as they are lacking in the fossil remains we have of the reptile. For a while, paleontologists thought that Pachystrophius might have been the oldest known example of a lineage of reptiles called the Charistodes, which includes some younger, superficially very crocodile-like species that you might remember if you've seen my recent video on every time things evolved into crocs. However, this new research has examined all the fossil evidence of this mystery reptile, and found that, actually, it's the last known example of a different reptile lineage called the Thalatosaurs. These animals only existed during the Triassic period, and paleontologists still aren't completely sure how they're related to other reptiles, but they're an interesting group. This means that Pachystrophius has gone from being considered the first of the Charistodeers to the last surviving Thalatosaur, also extending the known range of the group by a few million years. Interestingly, Pachystrophius likely could still move about on land with its robust forelimbs, being compared to the lifestyle of an otter. It was mainly an aquatic predator and would likely have fed on small fish and invertebrate animals. A very cool prehistoric mystery that has at long last been solved. Now we just have to find the skull. Next up, another fascinating paleontological mystery has been solved this week too. Pikaia is a very small animal that lived over half a billion years ago and has been found as fossils in the famous Burgess Shale of Canada, which preserves all sorts of amazing creatures that lived during the Cambrian period. Pikaia has been of particular significance as it has long been suspected to represent a very early chordate, the major grouping of animals that includes the vertebrates, which we ourselves are members of. So, Pikaia may have been one of our very earliest relatives. This little animal looked a lot like a modern lancelet, however its precise relation to other major animal groups has long been uncertain. Now though, this new research has re-examined numerous fossils of Pikaia and found that, actually, 
we had been reconstructing this animal upside down this whole time. Looking at the preserved internal structures of Pacaya fossils, they found that a gut canal can be seen running along the bottom of the body, and a dorsal nerve cord runs along the top, which is an undeniable indication that Pacaya represents a stem group chordate meaning it branched off before the common ancestor of all the living chordates evolved, but it's still a member of the chordates as a whole. Incredibly, the researchers also confirmed that the even older Cambrian Yunnanozoan from China, as well as other mystery animals called the Vetulicolians, were branches of the stem group of chordates as well. The researchers have therefore now produced a clarified evolutionary tree of these early chordates relationships, showing how different anatomical characters were acquired in a stepwise fashion and revealing a lost chapter in the evolutionary history of some of our oldest relatives. Next in the Paleo news, there's also been a new species of prehistoric giraffe named this week. Found in 14 to 11.4 million year old rocks in Pakistan, this animal lived during the Middle Miocene Epoch and is known from skull pieces, teeth, and foot bones. It's been given the name Bramiscus micros, which refers to it being of a smaller size than another prehistoric giraffe called Bramatherium, which also inhabited Asia. The fossilized pieces of the skull preserve the fused forward ossicones, and it likely had two pairs of these structures, with the back pair being straight and potentially pointing out to the sides. Bramiscus would have coexisted with several other prehistoric species of giraffes, indicating that this region would have been a pretty diverse place in terms of ancient giraffids. So, a very cool new species. And finally for the news this week, a new species of tiny hominid has just been named from fossils found in Germany. This little primate lived around 11.6 million years ago, also in the Miocene Epoch, and it's known from two teeth as well as a left kneecap. It's been recognized as a new species and called Baronius Manfred Schmidi, as the complex cusps and depressions of the teeth indicate that this is something distinct. They also indicate that Baronius was a hominid, the group known as great apes to which we belong, along with the orangutans, gorillas, chimps, and bonobos. Comparing the size of the teeth with other primates, the researchers estimate a body mass for Baronius of just 10 kilograms, or about 22 pounds, which would make this the smallest hominid species that we currently know of. Another interesting thing is that, unlike in the Miocene of Africa, where hominoid primates are often found in places with multiple species coexisting with one another, in the Miocene of Europe, no coexisting hominids had been discovered. Until now. Baronius actually comes from a site that has previously yielded fossils of a species called Danuvius guggenmosi, named in 2019. The teeth of these two hominids suggest that they were niche partitioning to avoid competing for the same food sources as Danuvius has teeth better suited for processing hard objects, while Baronius likely had a softer diet. Plus, the kneecap anatomy of Baronius suggests a different climbing style, and the paleontologists hypothesize that it may have typically foraged for food higher up in the canopy than Danuvius. So, another incredibly fascinating discovery this week. Well, that's it for the news. I hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Also, be sure to go follow our TikTok and Instagram accounts if you'd like for more paleontological news updates and short form videos about various extinct animals. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.